the uh, PowerPoint <laughs> with me. I, and for some reason, the version where I stuck the slide um, in kind of disappeared. What's killing North American birds? I don't okay. know. If you, um, I didn't take it out, but I, I did see it and I cut it and paste it. So into the one that we will use. So I think okay. that I think you've got it. Okay, good. I'm going to go ahead and share my um, slideshow. Um, because folks will start to be logging on. Are you planning on the, um, webcam from Cornell? Is that going to be live? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm muting myself. Okay. Sounds good. I'll talk to you in a minute. Hello everyone. Welcome. So glad that you're here. Happy March. This is fantastic. We're here in week seven of the semester already. We are cruising along. Um, and so as our centering today, um, I'd like you to really focus on your shoulders. So take a couple of deep breaths that go all the way down all the way down to the base of your being. You might want to roll your shoulders a little bit, stretch your arms. Just paying attention to your shoulders. This is the joint that makes the connection between the pectoral muscles here in our chest. Uh, and then it connects across to the levers that are our arms. And then the trapezius muscles are the ones that work in my back, at your back, around your shoulder blades. And there's a lot of power, a lot of power in your shoulders. So just bring attention to that. Maybe do a big shrug, lift your shoulders all the way up to your ears, and then drop them down. And then do it again, and maybe make it match your breath, drawing. Deep breath in, and then release. And so roll your shoulders, stretch out however it feels healthy and feels good for you. And the reason that I have you, I'm having you do that today is because our topic today is about birds. And if we think about the how essential these this set of muscles are, for birds, the idea that that's what they're using to fly, to carry their own bodies places, think about those beings and how they are being in the world. Their pectoral muscles could make up 30% of their weight. There's so much power for them in these muscles. And so as essential as they are to us, we can think about and extend that understanding to these other beings. We are bodies and they are bodies. So as we dive in to part two, so last Wednesday was our unexam, which signals the end of part one of the course. And now we're diving into part two, which might be more of what you expected when you signed up for environmental science. We've started with um, maybe an atypical approach to what environmental science is about. Um, and so today we're going to start um, with the topic of birds. 
and what's happening in our environment. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Doug Wenzel, who is a friend and colleague of mine. We work together at Shavers Creek, um, and we do all kinds of programming, um, but we, what we do quite a lot of the time is talk about birds. And so I, I welcome you, Doug. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, and it's great to be here. Hello, Bysai 3 Nation. <laughs> Um, so can you tell us your history? How, how did you get connected to birds, Doug? Yes. How did I? Well, you know, I, Jen, I've always been, you probably know this, but I've always been a curious person. And I think back to my childhood growing up in the city of Reading down in Berks Colony. And um, I grew up in a row home, but I, but I had parents who were, you know, our postage stamp backyard. They were very supportive. And one of those family, like I've asked my father, like, why did we do this? And he was like, oh, my mom did it. And so that's why we're doing it. And that was, you know, we would feed birds crust of bread, you know, if you went through the loaf and you couldn't get the kids to eat the crust, you, you sort of rip it up and you throw it out into the backyard. And I had no idea what birds were coming to the, eat the bread, but but I knew that there were birds in the backyard. And so I've always been aware of birds and it wasn't until decades later that I actually found some mentors that knew about birds and could give me the resources to allow me to understand the birds in my backyard and my world a little bit deeper. So I've always been a birder, Jen, or a bird watcher. I just didn't know it. And maybe a lot of the students that you have enrolled are also, you know, nature kind of hints at us, right? And then we eventually take the hint. So I might be talking to some future bird nerds out there. You bet. I know there's at least one out there. <laughs> Shout out to Avery, the bird nerd that I know. Um, and it's interesting, you've said a couple of things that really touched points that we've talked about. We've talked about particularly in the world of insects. So, you know, how it comes to be that if my parents were smashing insects, then I'm more likely to smash insects. And and so thinking about how that's come for you through your family of, this is what we do. We put these bread crusts out for the birds. And so what we learn, um, whether it's directly or indirectly, from those that, that we care about, those that we love, it's... Um, it's cool that that's part of your story. And so I appreciate your sharing. The other thing that comes up is that um, last week, their prompt for writing was, one of their prompts was, the more of the world I am in relationship, the more alive I become. And so can you speak to, I mean, that your bird story is going back for decades. And so how does that translate now or how, what, what does that make you feel? How does that connect you? Makes me feel happy, <laughs> to be quite honest. And you know, you can you can research the Happy Planet Index. You can you know do a dive into the, the happiness movement. But it's clear to me that over the decades, birds have brought me lots of happiness. Um, whether it's the connecting to a wider world, feeling as though I could take a, you know, a walk outside in my backyard and I could hear what I've come to think of as part of the neighborhood. And I, I really do think of birds as um, fellow earthlings. So I, I feel a sense of connection. I also feel in tune with the cycles of the, of the planet, whether it's you know, migration, or I'm always thinking about what are birds doing right now, what's happening in the backyard, what's happening in the wider community. And then because I'm a bit of a bird nerd, I volunteer time to help track birds. So and I think you know that people who are who volunteer and, and spend time helping others seem to also be happier people. And then to top it all off, birds get me out walking, get me out on a trail, they get me to go places that I don't think about gone if it wasn't for the fact that birds were there. So I stay active too, and birds help me do all those things. So I can honestly say, Jen, that I am a happier person because of my relationship with birds. And I know you are too. 
And yeah. then don't even get me talking about bird gardening and, um, you know, all the other stuff. And I try to get my kids into being bird nerds. They're both young men now. But, you know, you keep on poking and occasionally they'll say, let's go birding, Dad. And maybe it's just Father's Day. But anyway, it's still a good thing to hear. Planting seeds, you know, that's what you do, right? For sure. Um, for sure. And so that's what we're doing a little bit today, or a lot today. That's the idea of this class is exactly that. Let's plant some seeds. Um, and so what are you, what are you seeing or what do you, what, what birds are, what are birds doing right now? You mentioned seasonally. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was last night I was a little restless. So at about 1030, I went outside I climbed to my, this is, you know, in the evening up on the top of the hill and I'm listening and I, I live along a pretty busy road, but it's rural. So at 1030, it kind of gets quiet and I could, I could make out a great horned owl hooting in the distance. And, you know, they're the, uh, who's awake me to owl. And I could hear it echoing. And I think about great horned owls setting up territories, you know, it's already March 1st. Oh my gosh. There's, Great horned owls are on eggs, um, at least at this point. So that's exciting, or at least they're very close to it. Um, and then I heard tundra swan uh, passing overhead. And it's just a, it's an amazing sound to hear. So um, that's what I'm hearing. And then today, thanks to my colleague, John Kaufman, who also works at Shavers Creek, I keep my binoculars close to my desk, Jen. I have a window right here. So... I've been checking out the bluebird box. I've been watching bluebirds going in and out of the box pretty much all morning. So that's what I'm seeing here. But I, you know, I love the idea of webcams, don't you? I do. Um, I do. Because that it gives us a glimpse into what's happening all over, all over the world in different places. And so, um, so here I'll call up this, this webcam. That's great. So this is through the through the wonders of of technology. So this is this is live up at um, Cornell University's their lab called Sapsucker Woods, um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So that's a that's a morning dove sitting there, Jen. I think you can see it. Yeah. Now those other uh, little snow person there. That's that's not really a bird. That's just a a collection of seeds so don't let that fool you but the one on the right just moved uh oh there's a little chickadee in the background you know what i love about birds too is that it's just it's an authentic experience right like like this is happening right now and you you can't pre-program it it's not you know they don't release the birds that come to the feeder it's not a zoo this is really what's happening interfacing there goes the morning dove flying off so you never know what's going to turn up when you're watching a webcam, right? Birdwise, uh, sometimes you have people who are walking by and they say things that also kind of turn up on a webcam, but that's another story. Um, but the you can see it looks like a, a little windy there up in Ithaca, New York. But it's fun to sort of just zoom in a bird feeding station into your mm -hmm. into your world, and I know that there's. There's cameras set up on nesting birds of prey, like great horned owls and red-tailed hawks. I saw on the, uh, there's a Pittsburgh, there's a pair of eagles sitting on a nest in Pittsburgh. And the, in the middle of the night, the, one of the eagles got knocked off the nest by a great horned owl, and it was captured on camera. Yeah, it just, it just the eagle just fell to the ground, and... Um, and it turns out he's okay, uh, but it just out of out of nowhere, this great horned owl just yeah. So you can find footage of that. Um, so a question just came in in the chat. Um, some of the students want to know what what's your favorite owl owl to study or watch. Oh wow! Well. You know my. My favorite birds tend to be the birds that I see at the moment. So my favorite birds right now were morning dove and black capped chickadee. They came to the feeders. Um, oh, there's a little woodpecker in the background. Looks like a downy on that fence post. I would say, Jen, that 
you know, it's, in, if, I mean, I'm guessing most people who are in Pennsylvania who are, who are Zooming with us or YouTubing with us. So um, it's the owls that are here and, and very vocal. So I would say great horned owl because it's one of those birds that you just can step outside if it's a quiet area. And now is the time of year to really listen for great horned owls. So I think they're very accessible. And you can see them if you're in the right place at the right time. Well, look at that bird feeding station, Jen. It's really, it's hopping now, which is, again, you, you can't, you hope that birds show up. And it's great that, that they are doing that. So anyone can join a, you know, zoom in to a bird's feeding station like this, or as you're saying, a nest site too. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, it's a good use of technology, right? You think about sometimes technology getting in the way, uh, in this case, webcams, I think deepen our understanding of nesting raptors for sure. Again, I'll mention John Kaufman here. He's been, last couple of years, working on putting a, a camera up on barn owls, and then last year, nesting kestrels as well. So that's really cool. And what you learn are some really surprising things. Yeah. And it sounds like some of that curiosity is what what's driving your passion for this and excitement too about birds. Um, so let's uh, talking about what birds are here, and then thinking about what birds where they've been. Why don't we have as many birds right now? Um, so the transition time. It is. I, I mentioned the tundra swan going overhead. And, you know, we, we are name, name dropping here. There's a lot of nouns, tundra swan, black cap chickadee, downy woodpecker. And again, the resources that are out there, all these online field guides. So if some of this piques your interest, what, what does a great horned owl sound like? The Cornell lab that we were just at, all about birds, has that information in a very accessible way. So don't be overwhelmed. Um, there's lots of birds to know, lots of fellow earthlings. And bird by bird, you, you come to know the world, right? Um, yeah, the, we think about the fall migration of birds just, you know, leaving our area and heading south. But I mentioned we were, I'm watching bluebirds this morning. Bluebirds and robins, if, you know, they've been here in Pennsylvania the whole winter. It hasn't been that particularly... Uh, deep freeze. It's been cold, but it's not been really sub, you know, sub zero cold. And the snow's been patchy and deep in some places, but birds are able to find fruit and other food to keep them going. So not all birds head south, but on this particular slide, you're looking at the boreal forest across Canada, and a lot of birds are moving south. And for some of those who nest in the boreal region, like juncos and white throated sparrows, they consider Pennsylvania their winter territory. So it's, you know, the great, <laughs> the warmth of Pennsylvania versus uh, northern Canada. But then many others are, are heading further south into the tropics or neotropics, and we call them neotropical migrants. So those are a lot of insect-eating birds um, that have moved, you know, as well, as, as early as late August, some of those birds are already moving south. And the reverse, you may think, well, why are they leaving? Well, if you think about insect availability in winter, it goes down. doesn't mean that insects aren't here. There's just fewer and harder to find. But birds like chickadees can find them, and they're year-round here. But then you have, you know, you, you flip it around and think, well, why would I come up to the boreal forest to begin with, right? But then you think about, oh, right, in the summertime, the, the flush of insects does rival the tropics. And if you go further north, think about the available daylight. You have more hours to stuff insects into your growing family, the little nestlings. You can feed them more. They can grow quicker. And you know, when you leave the tropics, you leave behind some of the nest predators as well. We don't have, we don't have monkeys in Pennsylvania um, and further north. So there's some real good reasons why uh, food, space, avoiding some nest predators. And it's that extra daylight in the northern summers that really, I think, makes 
our habitats here in Pennsylvania and further north and south, you know, very attractive to these migrants. Yes. And so as they are then, like you mentioned, coming back, um, we have, <clears throat> pardon me, um, we can look at the real time data of what they're doing as they move back. So this is just a screenshot, but we can look at this in, in real time. So here's the, the abundance animation of the, um, of the Eastern Phoebe as it, as it's traveling. Do you want to explain what they're going to see as this <clears throat> plays? Yeah, this is, this is fascinating. And this is, you know, I mentioned about volunteering. So there's, there's thousands of people who volunteer and submit bird sightings to this, you know, it's really a social platform for, um, putting bird sightings into. So they're using that data from thousands and thousands of observers who have on their submissions marked, um, I saw a Eastern Phoebe here at this particular place and time. And so you throw all that, all that data in and it allows Cornell to produce these maps that are basically, um, you look down at the, the bottom right and it says January 4th. So, this is where Phoebes are on January 4th in this country. And you, you really see them, you know, clustered in Southern Florida, South Texas, along the coast, and just a few in Virginia and along the, the Northern coast. But as the season goes now, um, here it goes. You'll see it, the Phoebes on the move expanding. And this is all generated through real time, real observations of people out there watching and recording Phoebe's where well, that was the whole year, the ebb and flow of migration, right? And, oh, thank you. The Ides of March. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. So Jen, I don't know about you, but Phoebe's are on their way. And my dear wife's birthday is March 16th and Phoebe's in our backyard. I start looking for them in the middle of March. So I always think about, I always connect, um, birds and people and place together. So I mentioned just getting to know your backyard, but I th always think of Phoebe's as a birthday bird for my wife. I make sure I try to see them and say, happy birthday, Susan, your Phoebe's are back. Perfect. <clears throat> and so this, this database, um, Eastern Phoebe is one songbird in this database, but it's people that have collected, like you said, collected this data, the idea of citizen science, that anyone can enter data in to eBird, um, and it pops up and is useful in situations like this, where, where folks are tracking and following um, migration, or also tracking and following populations, which we'll, we'll get to um, in just a moment. So the... Um, So there's a spot nearby here um, where folks can watch hawks uh, and other songbirds in migration um, right at the top of Tussie Mountain. So as you drive over Route 26 at the border between Center County and Huntington County, you get to hike out the ridge and you come to an open spot there. Um, and that's where people are counting. The particular focus of this watch is golden eagles in migration because we get the highest count of golden eagles in migration east of the Mississippi in the spring, passing over Tussie Mountain. And this is a, a really fun opportunity. It's not far from town. It's a very accessible adventure um, to visit the Hawk Watch, um, Eagle Watch, Bird Watch at the top of the mountain. And it's a great place to soak in the sunshine too. Yeah, Jen, you, you think about what, you know, why birds, why should we care about birds? And there's so many different reasons why I find birds fascinating and why we need birds in our landscapes. But if you're just, you know, you want one of many, many reasons. Um, if you have a economics background or you're interested in tourism, certainly birds are 
Drivers are incredible drivers of economies. There's a lot of people who, when asked, what do you like to do outside? Wildlife watching comes up on that over and over again. So not only from a sense of, you know, birds are hunted. You can hunt ducks and woodcock and grouse and, you know, and we eat birds, right? Chickens and, and we wear bird feathers in our down jackets and we name our sports teams after birds. I'm an Eagles fan. I told you I was from Berks County, go Eagles. Um, but I could also be a Ravens. I wouldn't be a Ravens fan, but you get the idea that birds are so inspirational that we name sports teams after them and high school teams. And, but on Tussie, you know, it's up there and um, it was stumbled on by a person who just noticed that there were a lot of golden Eagles migrating on a day in February or March and thought this would be an interesting place to, to sit down and watch. And, you know, it's been continually uh, staffed for a number of years now. And the data is, is really, I think, interesting for people to know that golden eagles are already on the move and to understand that there is a population, eastern population of golden eagles, and they depend on habitat like, you know, Tussie State Forest here, this, you know, to migrate over safe places where they can move and if they need to put down places to possibly hunt. So hawk watching is huge in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So we have a question. Um, can birds recognize people? Yes. Yeah, uh, for sure. And if you're interested in, I, I would say crows and um, Kevin McGowan, again, at the lab of ornithology is a crow researcher and he, um, he feeds crows and has done research on crows and he tells stories about, he gives them peanuts. And once they recognize Kevin, um, they sort of follow him and his automobile. So when he gets, he gets out, they know that it's Kevin and, and they expect something from him. So crows are intelligent, um, body mass to size of brains. Crows are equivalent to monkeys. So they're like flying, flying primates. Uh, so very smart birds. So that's one example, but there are, there's plenty of other examples of, of birds, especially researchers doing uh, when they're, when they're capturing or, or putting bands on birds or putting markers on birds. Um, it's clear that some birds will recognize human faces. And we know in our live animal here at Shavers Creek, we have birds of prey and the people that work with live animals uh, with, with the birds know that, if they were to do uh, something invasive, like like trim their talons, which has to happen, uh, that they will put a mask on or get someone else to do it because they're also trying to train and build trust with these birds. And that's another example of birds just recognizing human faces and knowing who to trust and who's not so on the up and up. Yeah, for sure. Um, and one other question has come in about when do purple martins get back to central Pennsylvania? Soon. 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 And we could, we could go to eBird and do a search on purple martins and start looking for observations. I could also put a, uh, an alert on eBird to tell me when purple martins begin showing up, but, uh, they're insectivores. So you think about, um, some clues there would be when do you start seeing flying insects and, um, and, and thinking about when would the resource be here to support birds in migration and birds staying here. So we know Phoebes are coming back. They're insectivores. They also eat fruit in, in a pinch. And whenever I see Phoebes in the, you know, when it's still cold, we get a cold snap. I often see them around water resources. So they're looking for, stone flies or maybe something coming off the stream or just insects that are attracted to this open water. So it looks like, um, this is fascinating, Jen. This is from the great backyard bird count that just happened a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. to give you an idea of this, this citizen science and the reach of a platform like eBird, um, in the world, there's, there's only about 10,000 birds. So on this weekend in February, the great backyard bird count. Now that it's an international count, you know, you're looking here and it says uh, species observed 6,398. That's out of 
a possible 10,000 total birds on the planet. So it blows my mind that you have um, that many people out looking and finding birds. And um, that complete checklist is, uh, you know, 323,000 checklists. Um, it's just amazing. So there's, there's really hundreds of thousands of people that participated in the Great Backyard Bird Count worldwide. So it tells you birds are cool. Birds are cool. Um, but these counts are telling us other things, too, about their general general bird populations. And this news has come out in the last year related to, um, related to birds um, is that it's not, not great, the news. No, and as we get better at understanding and monitoring bird populations, and when you when you involve lots and lots of you know thousands of volunteers and you begin to assemble long-term databases like the breeding bird survey they're able to use this to say in this case it's a snapshot of north america so the us and canada in 1970 in say the breeding birds there were um, a snapshot in time say june of 1970 there were 10 billion birds uh, in North America. And when you look at that same snapshot today, we've lost 3 billion of the 10. So a third of all, a third of birds are now missing from North America. And that's just big picture population. And, you know, quite alarming, quite alarming. There's, they're not all, um, if you look at different groups of birds, it's not all doom and gloom, but for many species, like these colorful warblers. So this is the percent decline of particular bird species. So as I list these, as we list these, you may not have ever heard of a cerulean warbler. It might not be part of your world yet. Um, and yet, these creatures, these beings, have been here a lot longer than we have in many cases. Um, and so the decline of these bird species is quite alarming um, to have lost 3 billion birds over the course of the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and so Today we're going to look, Doug and I are going to dive now into why that decline is happening. Um, and this is where part two of the course gets hard, is because we end up talking about really challenging issues that are happening in our world today. Um, and so this is just, this is the first day that we're going to dive into this. Um, and I really just encourage you to take this in and think about what it means, um, what it means for this place that we call home. Um, and so we've, we talk about the fact that these birds are migrating, that there is, um, so this is exactly in the time span that Doug was talking about. Granted, this that we're looking at is loss of forest habitat in Central and South America. So thinking about the idea that these birds really have two homes where they're spending significant amount of time there in Central and South America in during our winter and then moving back north um, during our summer and needing to have resources in both places uh, and for the long journey in between, which is just astounding to me that these birds are traveling thousands of miles to find the resources that they need. But what happens when they get back to their home, whether it's the southern or the northern home, and what they need is no longer available? So their resources, the idea that, that here in this region of Brazil, the farming has just um, has increased the land use um, in a way that that is not natural compared to what it was even just not too long before that. So certainly people need to eat, but 
that consideration of how how land is used um, is really important. And it happens here as well. So in our suburban situations, you can imagine that where this neighborhood has been cut out and those homes have been built, I would imagine that all of that was forest, like the little slivers that are there in the picture now. Um, so this habitat fragmentation, um, it's not only taking away the, the resources that where the birds need to live and perch, but it's increasing the dangers for those birds. Um, so it's true that this deforestation is also contributing. They say it, deforestation contributes 14% of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions according to the American Bird Conservancy. So this is a problem. Doug, what else happens when we open these habitats like this? Yeah, it, you know, Jen, what people, researchers are discovering as well is that, you know, when you have, like around Shavers Creek, there are, we have a, a bird called a wood thrush that nests here at Shavers Creek, and it will come back to nest. And the birds that were raised here as young wood thrush will come back to the same wood lot as you know their um it's sort of their their breeding home and the same thing happens in the tropics so the wood thrush that nests around shavers creek goes to a specific spot in central america and you know it there's um sort of a safety to know knowing your home and where to find the resources that you need whether it's cover or food or water so it, it really is, it's not just the idea that it's the tropics or it's Central America, but it's it's this particular habitat in the tropics. So you can get really fine as far as, you know, how changes in one place affect bird populations in another place. So if something happens to that spot in Central America where our, our wood thrush go, it could come back to mean that there's fewer wood thrush here at Shavers Creek. And it's hard to make up those those losses, populations take time to recover if they can. So this habitat loss is is severe, and it is probably the leading cause of a lot of um, pressure on birds. And when you when you carve up habitat, if you're a bird that needs lots of forest area, and all of a sudden you know the area that you have is is cut in two, it makes it harder to eke out a you know feed your young, protect your young, stay away from predators. So there are things like raccoons and uh, mammalian predators that have an easier time finding the possum, the raccoon, have an easier time finding these bird nests or adults sitting on eggs on their nests uh, when the habitat is cut up. And there's lots of other little microclimate things, but it's better to have big forest tracks than lots of little forests. So this habitat fragmentation is not good. And you know, if you're if you're managing land or thinking about that, you know, the more informed you can be. Again, I'll go back to it's wonderful that we have Rothrock State Forest. That's over a hundred thousand acres. And the local conservancy Clearwater just added uh, I think it's like twelve hundred acres onto Rothrock in part of northern Huntington and Center County. So that's a victory um, trying to add on to a bigger patch of land. So that's good. That is good. Yes. So other other things that affect birds in their migration. These communication towers that interrupt nighttime migration. Now we don't, or it, it, it was years until I understood that that birds are migrating under the cover of darkness, and this could be. It could be thousands of birds moving. It could be millions of birds moving at night. The ones that we even think of as daytime birds, the songbirds, are moving at night. So it's not just owls that are affected by these kinds of communication towers. The, the lights that set off um, or may disrupt their courses along the way. Um, so communication towers are another another new th challenge for birds.
pesticides and other chemicals. Um, we, it's likely that you know the story of the, the DDT and the bald eagles, how they were affected, um, Rachel Carson and the story of Silent Spring, how it was the, the fish that the bald eagles were eating were infected or were um, laced with these chemicals that then made the eggshells of the bald eagles too thin for the bald eagles to sit on and actually hatch, bring them to, to, to hatching point. Um, and so the, the decline of the bald eagle based on chemicals. And so we don't use DDT in this country any longer, um, but there are lots of others that are being used. Do you wanna to add to that, Doug? Well, just, just the common sense of if a chemical is killing insects, you know, that's probably a nasty chemical. So if you're a bird that eats insects, it doesn't take much research to make connections between the fact that a lot of our insect eating birds are in decline. And I don't know about you, but it doesn't, you know, I love eating organic and there's a reason why I don't use pesticides in my backyard because I, I care about birds. Whether it's herbicides or pesticides, I just would rather figure out other ways. So it takes a little more research, but you know, um, but it's alarming to walk into a big box store and just look at the chemicals available and how just a little change in what is acceptable socially with someone's lawn, for instance, you know, I don't mind having dandelions in my lawn. I'm actually kind of happy that I have dandelions in my lawn versus I need to, you know, put some sort of weed killer on my lawn. Um, if it kills things, it's generally not a good idea to broadcast it out. It's a good rule of thumb, Jen. I, I agree. I agree. Um, wind turbines. This is, this is a big debate because as we are trying to minimize our use of fossil fuels, looking for alternative energies, wind turbines are, um, are a, a good source of energy. And so the debate here for wind turbines is a, a matter of, um, of where they're sited, where the, the wind tur turbines are placed using what we know about what's happening in the natural world in order to put them into, um, into good places um, where the birds are not going to be affected is really um, an important research project for sure. Um, the annual loss of birds from wind turbines was estimated to be about 573,000 birds lost, and that was in 2012 um, when wind turbines were just becoming more popular. So there's something to be said for this. So yes, it is alternative energy is critically important, and yet how to do it wisely is the challenge. And it's good to see it. It is, it is an issue, and people are working on it. And rightly so. We do need wind. We do. Yeah. Um, and cars. It just happens. Sometimes happens so fast. Um, but it sometimes happens because we're going too fast. Um, and so just an awareness. Yeah, I taught one of my sons... I taught both my sons to drive and I remember driving around with the older one and within the course of a afternoon drive, um, we hit two, well, he was driving, he killed two birds, Jen. I was just appalled and I was just like, you know, like slow down, so, you know, just telling him and some of it is just where you're driving. If it's, you know, shrubs on either side, but a lot of it is just an awareness and once you there's a warning. Once you become aware of birds in your landscape, it starts to influence common behaviors. Like as I'm driving, I'm really focused. I, I really am. I'm really focused on the road. And uh, with spring on its way, you know, frog 
migration is going to be moving across. So I try not to drive on on rainy spring nights just to avoid smashing salamanders and frogs. And daily, on a, every time I commute back and forth, I'm always watching for birds. It's just something that you get used to doing because you care. window kills. This is something that's happening, that happens all over. Um, and again, being aware of this, it's that the bird, birds see the world differently than people do. And so there's just not, um, we can't make assumptions that they just know and that they could just adapt to these things that we are that we are doing. It's not their responsibility to do that. Uh, and so to make, to put up bird friendly glass, um, they say that window kills uh, um, are up to about a billion birds annually are killed um, because they hit windows. And so again, awareness is the key and, and being able to um, put up nets or screens or things that there are ways to do this that don't impede the line of sight for the people looking out through the windows, but there are ways to protect the birds who are trying to navigate their world. So. Jen, birds see an ultraviolet light, so maybe there's research going on to try to figure out how to use the fact that a bird's world looks different to birds from our world. They just have, they see in a, a different way, a wider range of wavelengths. So maybe there's something that glass manufacturer can can do that will take advantage of how birds see the world. But yeah, window strike is something again that Shavers Creek has taken seriously, and we hope to be a leader at Penn State in making sure that all new buildings are aware of birds and potential dangers. There's some real buildings on campus that a group of us are working on to try to do some research about bird strike, record that data. So if you're on campus and you come across dead birds, take a photo on your phone and uh, I can give Jen the contact information who to send that to. But working together, hopefully we can educate physical plant in trying to avoid situations that just, it's not needed to kill birds. There's some simple things we can do. Cats. It's estimated that there are a hundred million feral and outdoor cats. Um, that they they are an invasive species, and they are having enormous impacts. It's hard to believe that the number one killer of songbirds are cats. So all the other things we mentioned, whether it's, you know, they all contribute, but it turns out that Kitty here is responsible for killing lots and lots of birds and lots of mammals in the billions each year. So I love cats. I have a cat that stays indoors. If I want to take him outside, I can put a little harness on him. We can go for a cat walk. I can put him in his uh, catico, whatever it's called, patty, cat. A patio for cats. Yeah, catty con, catio. It, it's just, you know, it's um, it's sort of like subsidizing predators. You know, um, you release a cat into the world and you hope that the cat doesn't have an impact. But cats are cats. Cats are predators. That's how they're wired. So why would they not want to capture things and, and explore their world that way? They're killing lots and lots of things. So that's one of those simple things that people, you know, a lot of times it's hard to talk about because I love cats, I love animals, I didn't realize, but the science is in. Cats are killing billions of birds each year, and it's something that people can take action to stop that by keeping cats indoors. So there is a Cats Indoors network, and you can certainly find out more information about all the benefits of it helps cats, it helps people, it certainly benefits the birds in your backyard and the mammals too. Yeah, look at that. Is that amazing? Um, just a visual representation of, you know, all those industrial collisions that we, that we mentioned, 
um, communication towers, wind turbines, power lines dwarfed in the estimate of just total number of birds killed by cats. Yeah. Now you know. Yeah. And then there's climate change um, on top of all these other things is the way that our world is changing and, and is provide it's this um, in some places really catastrophic happenings that affect people but they're affecting the animals in the world around as well. And we'll be diving more into climate change next week. Um, and so, Doug, we just have a, a minute or two here. So the point being that, that they used to take canaries into the coal mine because the canaries could tell when the situations became unsafe. The canary would stop singing because there was less oxygen available and the miners would know that it was time to get out. Um, and so the bird was serving as a warning. Think about what we've talked about today and how birds might be serving, they are serving as a warning to what's going on in our climate for, um, for all the other beings on this planet. Um, yeah, Jen, if we started out with 10 canaries, three of them are already dead, so we need to, we, we've been warned. And it's an odd message to say, you know, here's all the threats when you're still in this, you know, we want you also just to appreciate and love your, you know, the avian world around you and get to know them and, and let them be a part of your world. And at the same time, fight for them. That, that's hard to do. There's so many other things to, you know, to fight for our time and our resources, but Birds certainly bring joy, and they have made me a happier person. Um, this spring, you know, just listen to birds' song. It's fascinating to listen to, and they're one of the few things that are animated year-round that you can enjoy. And again, bird by world, bird by bird, I've come to know and appreciate the world. I wish it for you as well. It's a lifelong learning, and that's the other thing about what we find about the happiness index is that people who continue to learn through their life are happier. And birds certainly gives me an avenue to continue to learn for the rest of my life. Yeah, so thank you. I'm going to post on uh, Canvas, I'm going to post a slide that we didn't get to today of seven things that you can do to support birds. Um, and I encourage you to look over that list because there are things on there that are not hard. There are things on there that are, are everyday, simple things to be aware of that will help birds. Um, and so I want to thank you for spending, here it is, this is what you're going to see as when I put it up on Canvas. Um, and here's your pack back question for this week. Um, why care? I want to thank you for spending time with us today, Doug. I really appreciate your coming and and sharing your thoughts. Oh, people want to hear a bird call. I'll do my um, gray horned owl so you can go listen to it. It's the five who, who's awake, me too. See how accurate I am by visiting All About Birds and listening to real recordings of gray horned owls and try it at home. Great thing to do. That's good. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Have a beautiful day. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye, yep. Sci Nation. <laughs> Spend the time. <laughs>